Hey, hello everybody, this is Purge, bringing you guys a Underlord guide. I wanted to make something that was a little bit more compressed and less long than the replay commentaries. I'm still going to make both, but hopefully you guys like it. So, let's talk about Underlord, new hero in the game. He has a couple interesting skills. His first one is Firestorm. You shoot down six waves of green fire from the sky in an AoE, and it does a nuke every time, 70 damage, very low, but there's six of them, so it does about 420 magic damage. And, if you walk through the fire and get hit by any of these, then you get a burn for two seconds, which does up to 3% of your max HP. So this skill does maximum 420 magic damage, and it does up to about 21% of your max HP in terms of magic damage as well. So very, very high nuke and good against heroes, even scaling into the late game. In the early game, though, it's also very good in terms of farming. Um, this is an early game clip where I stacked a, a medium camp a lot of times. Um, I personally like playing Underworld as a support. I think he's very effective at this. And there's a couple reasons that Firestorm really allows him to be a stronger mid-game farmer. As you can see, I'm focusing fire on the magic resistance creeps, the small centaurs. Um, I did clear another one there before stacking again, but now I'm able to very rapidly in the early game with Sol Ring just consistently farm and clear creep camps. I made a small mistake with this though. If you look at where the Firestorm is, I should have placed it slightly to the left and ran to the left of the camp. That way I could make them run through the Firestorm in a sort of a U-shaped path. That way I maximized the, the fire drop downs a little bit more. But either way, it was pretty effective in that I could clear this 4 or 5 stack, whatever the heck it was, very early on in the game. Which gave me levels and gave extra experience to both my carry, the Slark, as well as the Disruptor. Very fast, almost level 5 here at 4 months. Immediately after I finished this, I went right back to pulling. Um, I was able to accomplish this because I got a first blood and a fast soul ring, but I think it really shows Firestorm's value in terms of the early game, even with only two skill points. Here's another point in the game where Firestorm is very effective. Um, at any point in the game, once you have soul ring tranquil boots, stack a camp, cast Firestorm, right click down the one creep that has magic resistance so that your Firestorm continues to do more damage. And it is fine to do that, that's one of the really nice things about Firestorm, it's that while you're clearing these creep waves, you can just auto attack down that one creep that's low, and once it's dead, your Firestorm continues doing more damage. For nukes that just are thrown out and instantly do their damage, those kind of creeps are really annoying to deal with, because they kind of die around the same time as a lot of the other creep camps. So for a melee hero it's hard, but due to Firestorm doing delayed damage over time, even if the first half is resisted, the second half won't be because you would have right clicked down that creep in time. Um, your second skill is Pit of Malice. Pit of Malice is a pretty strong disabling skill. It's very long cooldown at level 1 at 21 seconds, but the nice part about the one skill point is it does 100 magic damage. Very, very strong level 1 nuke. Very similar to Ice Path in the future, or in the past, on Jakiro. Um, this skill gets really good in the late game because then you'll be on a 12 second cooldown, which is the same cooldown as Firestorm. Therefore, every time you cast Firestorm, you should also cast Pit of Malice. And it immobilizes people, prevents them from moving. Uh, which means that they're going to stay in the Firestorm for longer. The other really cool part about this skill is that as it's up, it stays up for 7 seconds. So even if something hasn't been disabled from your initial cast, if they walk into that AoE or blink into the AoE or whatever in the next 7 seconds, they will be then disabled for 2.5 seconds. So while you keep it up during teamfights, it'll be really strong. It also has some other really good benefits, namely that it actually works against BKB heroes. So this is an example of a game that I played versus a lot of melees. In fact, it was five melees, so my disables felt pretty good. It's able to disable three heroes here, one of which had BKB on. If you're Pit of Malice and then you pop BKB, you will remove it, but if your BKB is already on, it will last on you for two and a half seconds. So it's very, very good against melee heroes who normally are very good at kiting. Here's another clip of that as well. Um, this one, I just plain casted it really poorly. Um, while I was trying to save my Razor here, and it didn't really matter because the people I was playing against weren't very experienced in it, and they just kind of walked right into it. So, got like three heroes to follow up walk into it, which gave us easy disables, and again, more Firestorm damage being done during that whole duration. Very, very strong skill, very good against melee heroes, especially BKB heroes. Um, your third skill is called Atrophy Aura. What this does is a 900 radius aura that reduces damage of enemy heroes and creeps. Keep in mind that 18% reduction with level 1 is only based on your base damage. So if heroes buy a lot of things like Rapiers, Daedalus, things that give you plus damage, then Atrophy Aura doesn't affect them. If you're against heroes like Morphling, Terrorblade, Luna, heroes that buy a lot of stat items, then those stat-based damage increases, Atrophy Aura actually affects. So he's better against some heroes than other than others. Um, the best thing about Atrophy Aura though is that if enemy creeps or heroes die in your aura, you get bonus damage to your Underlord hero. So if creeps die, it's 5 bonus damage for 30 to 45 seconds, depending on how many skill points you have. And if it's hero that dies, you've got 30 to 45 bonus damage for 30 to 60 seconds. For that reason, it's not very worth getting multiple points in Atrophy Aura in the early game, because your damage increasing 
kind of happens based on creeps, but it's mostly about heroes really buffing it up heavily, and you can't really expect heroes to die before you get that damage sometimes. So I don't like getting maxing the scout early, but in the early game, it's very effective, even as a support. I have one clip here from a game when I was playing support. I actually got Atrophy or level one. Now let's look at why this is actually worthwhile. Underlord is, he has stupidly high base damage. I have 65 base damage, not including my two Ironwood branches. That's on average, by the way. I also have 700 HP, level one, and I have four armor. My survivability is ridiculous. My right-click damage is ridiculous. And with Atrophy Aura, it further reduces my opponent's damage by 18. So this Elder Titan, who normally hits for 52, he doesn't use his spirit because he's bad, but the Elder Titan that normally hits for 52 is only hitting me for 45 damage. I'm hitting him right now because one creep died in my AoE because I got plus five here. He's hitting for 45, I'm hitting for 72 damage on average at level one. It's actually ridiculous. And this gets even better if your allies start pulling or if you do a pull. If you do a pull and a couple creeps die, then you get 5, 10, 15 bonus damage that you can use to trade with your opponent. It's actually very effective as a level one skill. Um, the last skill that Underlord has is called Dark Rift. Dark Rift, what it does is you click on, you cast this on a allied tower, creep, or your fountain. And what it does is after a delay, it will teleport you and a radius of heroes around you to that location. It's really obvious when it's teleporting in, but it's mostly used as a defensive skill. If you're getting ganked, if you're going to die, you use it to teleport home. This allows you to split push, it allows you to defend against split push, and it also allows you to save your teammates if they are dying in a bad team fight. And I have a clip of that, so if it will load. So this is a point, uh, Razor had already died here, my mech wasn't quite up in time unfortunately, and I realized that we are in trouble because Slark was here and we had a sentry, so I cast Dark Rift, I pop mech, right before I go, and after five seconds, it completes the teleport, and I was able to save the silencer. Unfortunately, um, we did still lose the anti-mage here due to the duel, but as a whole, it was a pretty good team fight. We got four kills compared to our two deaths. It was our two cores that died, but I saved both supports, so that's kind of good. The other downside is maybe silencer would have lived longer than me and gotten some AoE experience, but it's kind of hard to say. Regardless, I definitely saved myself, and I quite possibly saved the silencer as well. So, a uh, very, very good skill there. So that's the basics about underlord skills the uh the more important thing is how you play the hero in the early game like i said i really advocate for him as a support because his skills don't really scale past the mid game yes firestorm does do damage based on how much hp people have um and yes underlord plays in a way that he is basically farming items to have items that help you win the game so arguably you could justify things like radiance veils support items but that's the thing if you're playing a core and you're only buying support items with your farm like mech vlad's force staff i think you're missing the point a little bit and to really break this down i want to look at skill builds i made this awful graphic told the uh, stole um these images from dota buff um which you know is completely fine by the way i'm sponsored just ftc don't 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 find me these are the three games that i played for underlord i went different skill builds every game but i think it's pretty safe to say that you can go a little bit different skill builds every game i think you should always max firestorm ASAP because the amount of farm that it gives you in addition with Soaring. So with Soaring, Tranquil, and maybe even a Raindrop, you have tons of mana, you can cast tons of spells, you can stack jungle camps and clear them very rapidly, especially with Astrophy Aura, because it gives you bonus right-click damage whenever creeps die and you're killing creeps, right? So all of this allows you to jungle and farm very rapidly. And then this transitions into the mid-game, where you're buying support items like Force Staff, Vlad's, Mech, things like that. I'm not a huge fan of Mech because the build up to it is a little slow and it takes a lot of item slots that you could use for like wind lace, uh, wand, raindrops, things like that. But once you do build mech, it's a very good item. Um, I just generally feel like Vlad's is superior. But th really the point I want to drive home is that the early skill build can kind of be all over the place. You can go Pit of Malice with Atrophy Aura as a laning support. You can go um, Firestorm with Pit of Malice as your early skill build. It kind of just depends on what's going on. So for example, if in my early game I get a lot of stacks, I'm probably going to want more Firestorm early. If I'm trying to zone my enemy offlaner and he's trying to contest my pulls, then I definitely want Atrophy Aura. Because while I'm pulling, neutral creeps are dying. That gives me 5 bonus damage, which lets me trade more efficiently with my off the offlane hero afterwards. Because then I'm doing more damage and he's doing less damage. So Atrophy Aura is really good in that game. But if I'm getting tons of stacks, then I probably just want to get Firestorm to clear creep wave. So try to vary your skill build a little bit based on what you're up against. If you're up against a lot of melee heroes and you guys are having trouble 
um, in a trilane. You definitely want one Atrophy Aura because it's going to reduce three heroes damage, and if somebody dies and you get bonus 30, there's like a lot of cases where you want to change up your, your skill build a little bit. Um, for example, in the second game here, I got three points in Pit of Malice. That was when I was neutraling. I think it was still worth it for me to get Atrophy looking at it now because it would have made me kill those neutrals faster, but if you're team fighting a lot, it might be better to get more pit early to have more disable. If you're trying to roam on pit lord or underlord, I think more pit of malice is good, but generally I think pit lord's really weak at roaming. I think that's the one support thing that he's pretty bad at, is that he has a hard time dealing out a lot of damage in a very short period of time, and ideally you kind of want a lot of disable from your allies to help you do more damage. So I don't really like him as a roaming support, that's easily his weakness, but as a tri-lane, as a zoning support against most heroes he's very good, as a pulling support he's fantastic, as a farming support he's also fantastic, and he transitions very nicely into the mid game due to his ability to farm and get items like Vlad. So let's talk about the laning stage a little bit. I said about things that he's good at, but let's show you some clips of that. Um, this is the start of one of my games. My Disruptor was zoning the Invoker. I know it's an Invoker, it was a stupid, uh, a bad player. But this is basically how one of your two supports to start every game. You start a pull, you connect to the large camp, and in the meantime, I've been getting an advantage this whole time. This clip lead led into the one where I killed the medium camp like three times, but look how much experience and gold I was able to get my team. Again, you should do this on any support, but the important thing was that I was able to clear a small camp and a large camp by myself, all before the two minute mark. I ate that tree, I stacked the medium camp, and I got the rune. So this isn't necessarily the most like, hey, this is how you play Underlord, but this is a good, this is how you play support well. I farmed two camps, I denied one wave of experience, I stacked a medium camp, and I got a rune. That's five things that I did in a minute and a half. That's an amazing, that's like, this. that was a perfect first two minutes. And to make things better, I found the Invoker. Now, one really crucial thing that I did was, before I casted my Pit of Malice, I casted Firestorm. That's because Pit of Malice only gives you one second to disable, and he's so far away that I know that I'm only going to get two waves if I barely catch him with Pit of Malice. So I cast the Firestorm first, one wave of that does about um, 25 damage or something like that, and the burn does about 5 per second at level 1. So by getting two splashes on him and the Pit of Malice with just those two skill points, I did around 150 magic damage with two skill points, which is very good for any support. So you definitely can get those two skills and still be justified in killing heroes. So after I killed him, um, oops, wrong clip, I want to play this one now. After I killed him, I ended up stacking the large camp, or the medium camp again, and this is what led me into buying my soul ring, and then farming these camps a couple times, as you guys saw later. Immediately after I did stack, you know, resume pulling, all that good stuff, zone heroes, all that, all those great things. Um, immediately afterwards, there's a couple different ways you actually can clear stacks. Um, this is a slightly different game. Oops, gotta close this, my bad. Uh, this is a slightly different game. Um, actually, it's the same game, but we stacked the large camp a couple times. The important thing was that you can very easily clear these. You might look at this and say, wow, there's so many magic resistance creeps. This is really bad. But the reality is that it's so inexpensive to cast Firestorm that it's totally fine for you to do this. And because I had neutrals, we were very easily able to kill the Hellbear Smasher creep that would have had magic resistance. So at this point, I can basically just clear the three stack. The only creep that I didn't get the last hit on, I believe, was the medium Seder, which isn't that big of a deal. It's so maybe like 30 gold or something like that. I got experience for all of it, my team got experience for all of it, and my carry didn't necessarily have to do the farm. Yeah, it's kind of good sometimes if your carry gets it, but in a lot of ways it's actually better if he can continue farming at full capacity while pushing his lane while we control the wave and get experience. So there's a mix of ways that you can get farm, but basically stack everything that you can when you're playing Underlord in the early game. It gives you so much advantage. Um, this is a laning stage clip just to show that your skill build can really be whatever you want here. Uh, in this game, I had one point in the aura. Three creeps died, so I got 15 bonus damage. Again, I'm right-clicking Elder Titan. He made a pretty big mistake here in that he stuck around for a long time. But just 100 damage from Pit of Malice, a couple right-clicks, and a very, very mediocre slow from Silencer leads to an easy kill there. So you can go two skill points, in one in Pit of Malice, one in your aura, and it's still very effective. Or, like I showed earlier, you can do the same thing. I did it when I killed Invoker, but I did it uh, also very similarly here. And that once uh, my ogre wrapped around, we had a little bit of slow from the um, ignite, and then I get minimum two, possibly three splashes of firestorm. So it's decent damage output. It costs a decent amount of mana, but if you have a clarity potion, you can easily recover this. So as long as you use your spells at the right time, don't waste them if you're not going to get a kill, for example. But if you use them at the right time when somebody's actually vulnerable, Pitlord does or Underlord does more than enough damage to actually get kills there. So that's your laning stage basically, focus heavily on pulling, sometimes you'll zone, but use that bonus damage you get from your Atrophy Aura to right click enemy heroes if you do have bonus damage. 
um, help your allies get kills, but definitely stack, pull, check runes, all that typical support stuff. Like I said, the only thing you can't do very well is TP to lane support or to roam. You're not very good at roaming, uh, but there's maybe some potential for doing that. If you want to go like Tranquil Boots with a um, uh, Orb of Venom, you can slowly right-click people down after you chase them. But as a whole, I think staying around the laning aspect is really important because of how much you can clear camps, stack camps, and get bonus damage from creeps dying. And uh, pulls are the easiest way to do that without messing up creep equilibrium. Equ equilibrium. There we go. Now, mid-game, Pit Lord is a little bit different. And by Pit Lord, I mean Underlord. Please work click. Okay, there we go. So this is a bit of an interesting point in the game. Um, this is the same game that I was playing against Morphling, and I want you to look at the map and see what I did here. So we killed the tier 1. We're actually losing this game pretty heavily because my tinker sucked and was ragey. Um, we're losing the game pretty heavily. I also had a rough early game. I didn't get that much farm, and my slowing was really delayed because I was buying lots of obs and sentries. Ogre didn't buy any of this game. So what I did here is after the tier 1 was dead, we have a ward giving vision, and what I did is I approached the creep wave and I just nuked it with Firestorm. The Beastmaster didn't anticipate that I was there, because if you look at my positioning, it's nighttime. So he can he can't see that much past where like the, the range creep is. So if I just come from the side like this and I spend what did I spend? 245 mana here. If I had a soaring, this would be a lot cheaper. But without soaring, even still, I get three creep waves, I get bonus damage for my aura, and I can immediately run back to my jungle, stack a camp, and then farm it. Because I stacked this uh, this medium camp and then farmed it afterwards using my soul ring. So the important thing is that I push the creep wave. When you push the creep wave, it means that your creeps are going towards your enemy tower. And then your enemies have to go. Because if you see creeps hitting a tower, you say, I need to defend that. My tower would die. I would lose map control. My enemies would get gold. It's not a good thing. So if you take a support and you give them a soul ring and a tranquil boots, which is easily farmable due to your skills, and you go to a lane and you push it, then your opponents can't approach your safe lane or your jungle unless they smoke. They could go through like ancients into your jungle or something because we don't have a ward there but if they don't feel safe about that they would have to smoke and you can only smoke so many times so if you limit the easy opportunities for them to get into your jungle or to gank your heroes then all of a sudden it opens up your map heavily and it also lets me farm a creep wave that none of my allies feel comfortable farming at least until tinker has like blink and boots of travel that's the only time anyone else would be feel safe doing that so i push the creep wave i get three last hits i get free experience i immediately go to my jungle and stack and it creates pressure on the map, and it forces one of their heroes to show because they have to push that lane out, and they can't go gank now. So there's a lot of really good things that you can do by by doing that kind of push. I did it again a moment later as well. Um, farm the neutral camp, immediately came back to the lane again because I saw that uh, the lane was pushing out again. And you don't have to be here long. Even one creep wave and backing is really safe to do. Just by doing that, I, I, I essentially just created a lot of space. Um, let's, uh, it was this one. I created a lot of space for my team again. Um, yes, we don't see anyone on the map. Yeah, they could be ganking anywhere, but there's two dead heroes. And I know that if one of them does end up coming top, by the time that this creep wave is dead, I'm already walking away, so they already lost their opportunity to kill me. And then I go back to the jungle to farm it again. It's important that you don't spend too much time in the jungle, basically, um, because you want to always put pressure. And that's very important about a farming hero. If you play Underlord and you guys just AFK in the jungle, you're doing it wrong. That allows your opponents to create space and to push lanes and to get map control. If I push out a lane and then I go farm, it's 85 times better. And then if there's a team fight somewhere, I can TP to that lane and actually help in team fight if I have soul ring and make sure I have that upkeep. Very, very important that you play in that way. Now, um, sometimes with that early farm, you can actually do stuff with it. So in this game, I was able to get a very early Vlad's. And I think Vlad's is, is one of the best items for Pit Lord or Underlord because of the fact that it actually does allow you to push. Um, yes, you can clear creep waves really rapidly, but the important thing is that towers die rapidly only if you have a skill that does tower damage or if you keep your creeps al alive longer. So in this case, I was able to tank the tower hits so my catapult survived and every single creep here has four extra armor, which means that they have approximately 20% more HP against the tower. That could be the difference between two extra tower attacks per creep, which means that they're alive longer doing tower damage. And what happened in this clip was basically just me, three creep waves and a catapult, and we almost completely killed the tower. And you might look at this and be like, this is stupidly dangerous. Look at the map right now. You're close to their base. You're pretty low HP. Um, they have a glyph ready, so the tower's probably not going to die. And you're right. But by having this Vlad's here, I was able to do a stupid amount of damage to the tower. It's almost dead. And it forced a glyph out. And it forces a TP. And now, I just get to use my ultimate, and I go back to base. I'm alive. The only way, I, the only way that I die there is if I get arrowed or chain stunned or if there's a storm spirit with an orchid who jumps on me and silences me and kills me. But it's 16 minutes into this game. 
If if a Storm Spirit has Orchid at this point, then he went Treads into Orchid. And the build right now is Bloodstone first, which means Storm isn't going to be able to kill me before I cast Dark Rift. And probably can't kill me. I mean, he might be able to kill me, honestly. If he has one level of pull, he could maybe kill me because I tank so many tower hits. That was dangerous. But if I'm full HP, there's no way that a Storm Spirit can kill me before I get out. If they do a smoker and wrap around and chain disable me and kill me, congrats, you killed the... I don't know. I, I am technically the second most farmed tier on my team this game, so it's maybe not the best example, but you kill the pit lord. That's split pushing, you know? It's I can always farm and I can always catch up. In this game, it would have been bad because my net worth was high, but in a lot of other games, it, it's that was a very good example of using your farm in the early game that you justify based on your skills and your soul ring to exert mid-game pressure and open up your map for your opponent, uh, for your team, and give your team a better chance to win. So that's basically mid-game. Um, I'm missing one clip, I think. No, it's more of a late game clip. Let's go to the late game. Um, in the late game, when you're playing Underlord, uh, things are a little bit different as well. Are my late game clips not working? Okay, there we go. So this is a different game. Um, in this game, I was able to pick up a very fast Force Staff. Um, Force Staff here allowed me to save my Earth Spirit. Oops, this clip always plays sound very long, no matter what, and I don't know why, but it does. I'm going to replay and see if that helps. Okay, it's not helping. So, just to clarify, you're hearing two audio feeds. For some reason, this clip is just not working, and I don't know why. It'll stop any second. About now, I believe. There it goes. Okay. I It happened so many times, I knew exactly where it ended. Sorry about that. So, in this clip, I force back the Earth Spirit, which forces Storm to use an extra 300 mana to close the gap to try to kill him. And then I'm allowed to I'm able to separate my opponents. Jug thought he could get an easy spin kill here on Earth Spirit, but because Pit of Malice goes through BKB, it disables him, wastes his spin, and this means that the only damage they have is basically just Storm. And because um, Ogre was able to stun him, we also bursted him down in this period of time. So keep in mind as well that I was the only person buying support items this game. Ogre didn't buy any. I think at the end game screen he bought one sentry the whole game. So the way that you should play Underworld, in my opinion, is this mix of like five and four. You're five in the fact that you can afford to buy all the support items because you're so farmed, because you can always farm and push lanes and, and farm jungle camps. But you're playing four because you're spending a lot of time farming rather than team fighting. But this is good because it allows your five position heroes to actually grab items. And a lot of times those roamers end up not having much past like a boots and maybe one small item. But it's 20 minutes into the game, I've already got a four staff and I've been buying a stupid amount of wards, observers, smokes, sentries for my team, things like that. And by having a force staff now, before the ogre did, by the way, despite the fact that he wasn't buying support items, I'm able to save a hero and impact the team. This is very similar to the previous clip I just showed, where I get Vlad's, I do a ton of damage to a tower, all because I was able to with the hero's farming skills. This is how you need to play Underlord. If you don't play this, like, map pressure, farming items, use items to win team fights thing, then you're not doing it correctly. But I still think the hero has a lot of other value. There's another clip of, uh, of us saving people with force staff, just so I could show you guys, because it's fun to see. But looking around for team fights, we spend a lot of time farming the enemy jungle. Make sure you farm aggressively because that allows you to push very safely. We double forced half him there, actually. I think the Jug made a small mistake. Um, got stunned the same time he got e-bladed, so he just ended up dying. But, you know, that kind of advantage that you get from just having the forced staff early is absolutely massive. So let's play the next clip. Um, this clip was a bit interesting. Um, this is kind of just showing the value of Dark Pit in the late game. Um, same game, have four staff here. Now normally when somebody split pushes like this, if you're trying to push somewhere, uh, one of their cores will go to another lane and they'll just auto attack it. But what this allowed us to do by having Dark Rift is that if we really needed to show up to the top lane, if the hero enemy heroes were actually the top lane, we could show up using Dark Rift, get everybody there very fast. So in the meantime, we split push on the other lane. Now this is normally very dangerous. when somebody split pushes, what the plan is, Storm split pushes, one of our heroes goes back to kill Storm or stop him from taking a free tower. And then, as soon as we go there, Storm gets out, TPs the bot lane, and they take a 5v3 or a 5v4 when our heroes are top. So it's very dangerous normally to keep pushing this. But because I have Dark Rift, we're better able to actually go for this. Blink Dagger Online shows that he's here, and with Jug blinking forward, shit has hit the fan. So, cast Dark Rift to try to get my allies out. And the very important thing that I did here was that I needed to get my hero out of position, out of a uh, bad position. Because if they kill me before this finishes channeling, the ultimate doesn't go through. It's the only way to stop it. Um, or to kill, they'd have to kill what I teleport to. That or me. So I'm definitely at threat here. So to, to get out, I force staff myself away. And then I walk back into range to make sure that by the time it goes off, I've caught the morphling as well. Ogre made a slight mistake in that he stayed to throw the ignite. I don't know if he killed the Beastmaster here or not, but I don't think he did. 
So, four staff. Valuable. We defended against split push. I kept the carry morphling alive. And um, he might have gotten the um, beast master kill. And we got the storm out of it. So, like, the value that you get out of dark pit in terms of split pushing is amazing. It's really, really valuable. Here's a great team fight where I just did absolutely nothing good. This is what I did. I walked into the fight. I missed my pit of malice. I threw a firestorm down. But if you look at what's happening right now, basically, I'm standing in the area. I've got level 4 Atrophy Aura, so they're taking, they're doing like 42% less damage or something like that, 38% less damage, which is a huge amount. And I have Vlad's in the area. I've got plus 4 armor to my team, and they get 10% lifesteal, and they get 15% damage. I should have four staff the Earth Spirit almost immediately. He was in the smoke cloud a long time. But basically, all I did was cast two spells and stand there. That's all I did this fight. I was able to kill the uh, Necro 3 as well, which is kind of nice, 400 free gold. But the important thing was that if once we look at the uh, the fight recap, look how much damage I did. I did the most damage on my team by far. I did 1,200 points of damage by casting one Pit of Malice and one Firestorm. The second Firestorm was when I killed the Necro 3s and got 400 gold for free. But again, like, look what happened. I casted my spells, and they just kind of... Oops, I didn't mean to press that button. I casted my spells, and they just kind of walked into them. And it does percentage-based HP, so if they have a lot of HP, this is doing like 30 damage for every 1,000 HP they have for two seconds. So it's doing minimum like 60 damage for every every time that the fire hits, assuming it doesn't restack, you know what I mean? It does a lot of damage. I did the most damage by far just by casting my spells. So by having Vlad's four staff staying alive, huge impact in the team fight. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier was that don't jungle too much, and I think this is the perfect example of this. This was the game that I ended up buying mech instead. I skipped Tranquil Boots, I went for mech. I farmed this very efficiently, but if you look at the map position right now, um, we have an Anti-Mage in the top lane, there's some, there's an Elder Titan over there, but it's a little scary because they have a duel um, with Legion Commander, so they could kill him. But I'm basically just trying to AFK farm to finish my jungle or finish my mech as fast as possible. That way I can use that to impact team fights in a positive way. But the way that I farmed this was AFK jungle. I didn't do this by split pushing lanes. I just did it by AFK jungling. And what that does is it creates a lot of area on the place that my opponents can pressure. So they TP to the off lane, they start pushing it. Yeah, I'm stacking camps and I'm farming them. And I collected 600 gold really rapidly in like less than two, two minutes or something, which is really good as a support. And I did it safely in the jungle. But the problem is that it, it allows your opponents to take control of the map. So right here, right when I'm about to go finish my mech, I look at the top lane. The, uh, the tower is completely full, but because I was AFK jungle instead of pushing the lane, all of a sudden the tower basically is dead by the time I'm ready to TP. So this is a perfect example of you not wanting, you. it's why it's so important that you push out lanes rather than go to the jungle instead. And this is something like in that you have to consider. It's more of a mid-game clip maybe, but it's definitely very important. So that's how you play Underlord basically. I really, really recommend going for the uh, Tranquil Boots soaring in the early game. I think support Underlord works. He can work as a mid to late game hero, but I'm not quite sure yet what item that you buy in the mid game to impact as heavily as something like Vlad's mech for staff. Maybe you get a pipe sometimes, but as a whole, I think Vlad's mech is a lot safer in terms of what their damage outputs are and, and the fact that it makes your pushing a lot stronger and a lot safer. Um, what items do you buy late game is the last question. You can buy just about anything. It really just depends on what you're playing against. Are you playing against the Storm Spirit? You might need an Orchid or a Hex or a Glimmer Cape to save somebody or yourself if they get gone on. You might want like a Lotus Orb. That way you can remove silences from yourself or allies. You can reflect Omni Slash, things like that. Maybe you need like a Ghost Scepter. Although I'd probably prefer you get a Vlad's because your HP is so good that just increase your armor and your allies' armor is better than a Ghost Scepter, for example. But after this, buy Pipe. Um, maybe by Guardian Greaves, you can buy Boots of Travel, that way you can, for example, when Dark Rift is level 1 and level 2, it takes 5 and 4 seconds to go off, level 3 it's 3. So what you can do with Boots of Travel or a TP scroll is you can cast Dark Rift on your fountain, teleport to a lane, hopefully where your ally is dying, and as soon as you get there, within 1 second, you will teleport you and your ally back. So there's cool things like that you can do late game, which is why I delayed my ultimate in game 2 down here, where I got it at 13 and 17. I don't know why 13, maybe that was a misclick. but. Um, you can delay your ultimate, it's okay. And sometimes you don't really want to get your level 3 ultimate, which is why I didn't get it in the level in games 1 and 2, was because there was a possibility that at some point I'd pick up a Boots of Travel, and that would allow me to teleport to a creep or a tower, bring my allies back. If you get Boots of Travel level 2, then you can do that as well. Teleport directly on your ally that's dying somewhere on the map, and then bring him back a second later. You can't do that if you get level 3 Dark Rift, so kind of a decision you have to make there. Um, so yeah, a lot of late game item decisions. 
I generally don't like that boots of travel idea because it's just so expensive. But having boots of travel in Pit Lord is amazing because you can teleport to one lane, defend it, dark rift down, teleport home. You can do like you basically have three TPs. You become a very mobile support that can kind of be everywhere at the same time, which is very important for fights due to your nukes being very strong. So um, great team fight hero. He's very much a slow sieger though, uh, but he's a very fast farmer. Very good hero. I like him a lot. Um, I think he is viable for captain's mode, personally. I think, if anything, he might be a little too strong, but he's only strong if you play him in this way. And there's probably some strats that exist that exploit him and make him worse. Um, but against Trilanes, I'm not sure. I, I think if this guy gets a nerf, it's probably going to be in his base stats. Either his base damage, maybe his armor. Um, his strength and int gain are amazing as well, so maybe something like that. But I think he's in a pretty okay place right now. He was definitely more OP before they changed his third skill. It used to be something else that would give him sustain and heal and AoE damage. So, Pillard's fun. I like him a lot. I hope you guys learned a lot, and I hope this wasn't too long. This is my second take on this. I think I did better this one. I'm going to do a lot more things like this in the future. It takes a lot of time to output them, but I definitely want to make content that's more easily digestible and gives you more visual aids. I'll try to improve that in the future and make things flow a little bit better. And at some point, maybe get some drawing tools. So... Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want um, my full perspective on me playing a game, I am also doing a replay commentary for this game, or for one of the games. It was the one where I got four staff. That game. That game, I'll do a replay commentary. If you want to watch that, go find it. It's on my channel, youtube.com slash purgegamers. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Follow me on social media. If you want to see updates about me, either on Facebook or Twitter. There they are. Or my website. I've got my guide there. Uh, there's forums. If you guys want to ask me questions about builds and stuff. Sometimes I use those in videos. And uh, thanks to my sponsor, Dodobuff. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Bye.